We are really, really glad that you're here. We're just getting set up, ready for worship. Can I ask you to stand with me this morning? We're going to pray and welcome the Holy Spirit. If you are in the cafe, in the lobby, and we're going to encourage you to come on in. We're going to get started with worship in just a few seconds. Behold the swells. The indicate worship is going to begin. It's really good to have you here in our house. We want to give you a very, very warm welcome. If you're watching online, welcome. Thanks for tuning in as well. Why don't we take our hand this morning, just put it on our heart, and just uh, welcome Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you that you're so amazing. And here we have a day set aside where we can just enjoy one another's company and enjoy your company. And as we come into your presence this morning, Lord, we want to just tell our hearts to wake up and to praise you. You're wonderful. You're majestic. You're so full of everything that we need. And so this morning, Lord, we come and tell you that you're lovely. You're amazing. You're incredible. And you're majestic. Lord, would you grace us with your presence this morning? May we all encounter uh, you this morning. May none of us leave not having touched the very heart of God this morning. Can we uh, welcome Luke and his team? This is Luke's last Sunday leading worship. Luke, we love you. Don't screw this up. <laughs> Feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing, Ah, Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble did you hear the singers roar when the last began to sing of oh, Jesus Christ the saving one and here we see that God you're moving a mighty river through the nations and young and old will turn to Jesus. Fling wide you heavenly gates. Prepare the way of the risen Lord.
lift up a shout of praise to the Lord. Oh, we will open up the doors this morning with our praises, Lord. Oh, with our praises, Lord. Yeah, come on, just lift your voices. We will open up the way for you. We will open up the way for you. Oh, to come in, to come in, Lord. And nothing can Waking hearts to lie. Come wake kiss up. Love is deep, love is wide, and covers us. Love is fierce, love is strong, is furious. Love is sweet, love is wild. Waking hearts to lie. Yeah. You are waking hearts to life. You are waking hearts to life. Oh Lord, you are waking hearts to life. Oh, here you come, here you come, here you come. Oh. Love is strong, is furious. Love is sweet, love is. 
Praise him a bit this morning. You came to set the captives free. You came to bring us liberty. And my rejection met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to give you praise. Yeah, where spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain is broken free. Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom Cause your blood has covered every sin Oppression met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Where spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain is broken through you, Jesus. Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom to sing Yeah. 
of the Lord is there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Every chain is broken through you, Jesus. Where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Yeah. We sing. Where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Every chain is broken through you, Jesus. Because where the spirit of the Lord there is freedom. Sing whoa. Hallelujah, hallelujah Cause whom the sun sets free is free indeed And there ain't no chains that can hinder me Hallelujah, hallelujah, yeah And whom the sun sets free is free indeed And there ain't no chains that can hinder me Hallelujah Hallelujah And whom the sun sets free is free indeed And there ain't no chains that can hinder me Hallelujah Yeah, yeah, hallelujah Cause whom the sun sets free is free indeed And there ain't no chains that can hinder me Hallelujah Hallelujah Whom the sun sets free is free indeed And there ain't no chains that can hinder me Hallelujah Oh yeah, hallelujah Soon the sun sets free is free indeed And there ain't no chains that can hinder me
deserve the highest praise You are the name that forever will be proclaimed
saints life sweet smelling incense are the songs of the saints life sweet smelling incense to your heart to your heart are the songs of the saints life sweet smelling incense are the songs of the saints life sweet smelling incense to your heart oh father we want to please your heart And are the songs of the saints like sweet smelling incense? Are the songs of the saints like sweet smelling incense to your heart? Oh, are the songs of the saints like sweet smelling incense? Are the songs of the saints? Sweet smelling incense to your heart. And are the prayers of the saints like sweet smelling incense? Are the prayers of the saints like sweet smelling incense to your heart? just want to please, please your heart. Are the prayers of the saints like sweet smelling incense? Are the prayers of the saints like sweet smelling incense to your heart? To your heart, and are the prayers of the saints like sweet smelling incense? Are the prayers of the saints like sweet smelling incense to your heart? And are the Prayers of the saints, like sweet smelling incense, are the prayers of the saints, like sweet smelling incense to your heart. Your heart, which song sounds a melody? 
Just as we were singing, I heard that line that the songs of the saints. The word incense changed to innocence. And I heard the Lord say, sing the songs of innocence from your heart. songs of children, the songs from innocence. So this morning, let's just start to lift our voices and sing to the Lord. Innocent songs. Songs from his children. Lift your voices and sing, just sing, sing to the Lord.
Lord, we feel like we've run out of words to just express our gratitude to your unfailing love. But we're not used to this sort of love that's consistent, that's not dependent on our performance. Lord, in this new day with new mercies just waiting for us to experience, we just want to say thank you, Lord. You're so gracious to us, Lord. You're so patient in your dealings with us, Lord. You're amazing, Lord. So as your people this morning, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Church, can you thank the Lord this morning? Just give him a round of applause. Just tell him you're amazing, Lord. You're so good. We're grateful. Lord, for all you've done and all you're going to do, Lord, we're grateful. You're just amazing. So, Lord, we dedicate the rest of this day, Lord. We dedicate our lives to you fresh this morning. That we're a people who are grateful. We're thankful for who you are and what you're like. Lord, you're as good as you're great. And we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, find somebody and celebrate with them this morning. If you don't know them, just introduce yourself to them. Tell them your name. If you know them, give them a hug. Tell them why you're so happy to see them. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Find a seat wherever you can. Push somebody out of the seat that you want. They're Christians, they have to forgive you. It'd be a great way to meet them as well. I want to give you a very warm welcome. Thanks for being here at Grace Center. If you're watching online as well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, We're really, really glad that you're here. I want to welcome a specific group of people this morning who uh, we don't often welcome, but I want to welcome our youth, our junior and our senior high youth who are just amazing. For the last couple of weeks, AJ and I have had the great privilege of just stepping in and uh, helping with their amazing team that Aaron and Nat raised up there. Uh, They have an amazing group of youth leaders who have been running uh, the the junior and senior high ministries, and AJ and I are just there to uh, eat the snacks. They have amazing snacks, I have to tell you. I don't know, youth ministry was so good. It tastes amazing. But anyway, our uh, junior high, you guys are in this morning when we have a guest speaker, so I want to welcome you in our senior high. You guys are just awesome. Can we give them a round of applause, please? They're just amazing. We love them. And thank you to many of the leaders that I see here this morning as well. Well, one of the things we love to do as part of our worship every week, we love to create a space where we get to not only bring our uh, worship to the Lord in song or in dance, but also in our gifts and our giving and our tithes and our offering. And so we want to do that this morning. We want to give a, an opportunity where we can just bring those to the Lord and just say, Lord, you're so good. You're just, you're so good. You're absolutely astounding and you're astonishing in everything you do. And so one of the things we love to do is we love to make these declarations where we're just saying, God, this is not habit, this is not aimless, this is, this is something very, very deliberate and very, very intentional, um, and that we're doing. The Lord has got a lot to say about finances. So you, there's this thing out there that he implemented for our good called sowing and reaping, and that whatever you sow, it says, uh, you receive. And so if you want to be on the receiving end, you get to enter through the door of the giving end. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to read through this together, and then we're going to uh, bring our offerings to the Lord this morning. All right, let's pray this together. As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven opened, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, visitations, and divine manifestations, anointing, gifting, and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources, 
to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as we join our value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessings, and increase upon us so we have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Amen. All right. Perfect. Thank you. We're going to pass our offerings just now. On your way in, hopefully you are greeted warmly and you're given our bulletin. This is uh, just filled with events that are going on. Our, our summer is just absolutely amazing. There's some amazing opportunities for your kids. Uh, we've got camps. We've got weekends away. All of that information's in there. We're dedicating babies next week, uh, which is always a fun thing to do. Again, all the information's in there. There's just two things I want to mention. This Thursday, we will not be having worship and intercession in our evening session. I know that we have... Uh, t t three times on a Thursday that we meet together for prayer and for intercession. The Thursday night this week is not running, so uh, please stay home and intercede. <laughs> it's just a thought. <laughs> Remember, we do pray, right? And then the other thing I wanted to mention is we are running a Sozo regional training event uh, in a couple of weeks, the reason I'm mentioning just now, all the details are in the bulletin, but June 1st is the deadline in order for you to get into the early bird pricing. So if you would like to learn how to get more healing for yourself and for people to minister to, this is a great training day. Uh, Christy and her team just do a phenomenal job of not only ministering healing, but training and equipping people. Uh, and we have this cute little phrase that healed people heal people, hurt people hurt people. Transform people, transform people. So we'd love you to be a part of that as well. Um, before this service, we were uh, down in the prayer room, and we had a gathering there to just honor and to thank Luke Finch. This is his last Sunday with us. Uh, we so wish Deb could be here. She's uh, probably watching online if you are. Hi, Deb. Please send me some Cadbury's chocolate. I love you. Um, so Deb went back a couple of weeks ago with the kids. And the plan was that Deb would come back and be with us at more conference and be with us today uh, so that we could honor them and say goodbye to them. That unfortunately didn't work out, uh, some complications with childcare. And, uh, but we've got Luke here, and so we wanted to take some time this morning just to thank you, Luke. And so I'm going to invite Luke to come up and our senior pastor, Jeff Dollar, and Becky, and uh, we're just going to, we're going to bring the whole staff up. Okay, so all of our staff, our leaders, our elders, our, uh, everybody. Come on, I'm going to pray for Luke. And AJ. And AJ, and AJ. yes. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. A AJ is on no, strike. No, I just might as well go ahead and bring you guys up now because the thing's heading somewhere. We all know where it's headed. Tears and prayers and tears. But, uh, you know, I was, I, was um, I think I'd said this before that, come over here, that um, several months ago, uh, the Lord speaks to me uh, in different ways, and I call it a language, <clears throat> and he speaks to me either through a knock at the door uh, or I look at the clock on the wall and uh, our clock shoots the numbers on the ceiling, actually, so I have to, so the clock on the wall. Anyway, <laughs> there's a digital number, you know, if it's 323, then I'll look up all the 323s in the Bible and it, typically the Lord speaks through one of those. And there's been a few that he just, maybe it was just a pizza knock or I don't know, but, um, <clears throat> but I kept seeing uh, the number 11, and uh, usually after three or four or five times, I begin to get the, the message that the Lord's trying to say something. Well, so it was either uh, the number 11 somewhere, or I'd see 1111 on the clock, and 111, 211, 311, 4. It was so, so much so that uh, when we just came off of our vacation, uh, it, m most of you know that we went on a cruise, but... The table we sat at was 411. We were, went out to uh, visit London one day. We were in the 11th group, and I'm going, dear God. Well, for me, the number 11 means a few things. The biggest one is transition. And so after a while, I'm going, uh, I, I don't need to see 11 anymore. <clears throat> and so I kept seeing 11. Well, earlier this year, uh, we were meeting with uh, some staff, w with the staff, and coming out with a new rollout for this year. And Luke was the first one to come in, and we're talking about where we're going. He said, can I drop a bomb on you? And I was like, yeah. And he says, I feel like it's, it's time for us to go. And I was like, ooh. 
And I thought, huh, I wonder if this has to do with 11. And ironically, after that, we met with Aaron and Natalie, or Aaron, and Aaron said, guys, I got to be honest with you, it feels like it's time for us to move. I went, oh, there's the 1111 right there. And so for me, there was, a, there was obviously a grief, but also a peace, knowing that the Lord had been setting this whole thing up. And, um, and so, it's, uh, it's, so today is a, uh, a sad day. It's been a sad weekend. And uh, I was uh, telling uh, somebody yesterday, or the first day of the conference, I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> and I was sitting there going, why am, not, why, why am I not entering into worship? And I was like, oh, it's because I'm sad because Luke is leaving. And uh, so, you know, that verse we see in part, we hear in part, we know in part. I always say I am a part. And, um, but it's one of the things where, you know, it's, it's a good thing overall. And it's, I think it, uh, it's the Lord. And so, anyway, do you want to share something? Because we're going to pray over you. And uh, I, know, I know that Deb wanted to be here. So she, they, they got these really, really, really cheap airline tickets from the UK or from here back to the UK. I didn't know this, but the UK runs a special with Disney World. And they had these amazing charter flights. It's only one way to, uh, to Orlando for this incredible price. I mean, like a fourth of what we would pay to go uh, back to the UK from here. And uh, so it was the, uh, they run a special and the time was running out on that. So she had to take advantage of it. We totally understand it. But the thought was that she was going to get a chance to drop the kids off and come back and be with us today. But she can't. And uh, we totally understand that. And so... Uh, Luke, we want to, uh, and then we're going to pray over you. Uh, so let's give, yeah. <laughs> I could make a joke, but I'm not very funny, so I won't. Um, uh, this time for us is, I know if Debbie was here as well, she would say with me that this time for us has been one of the most incredible in our lives, for sure. Um, it was very, very clearly God, um, when we came here, without a doubt, it is clearly God to go again. And uh, today, as I've, I've been talking to people, it feels like we've been here for a really short time, but there's a depth to what's happened that far exceeds the natural time spent here. Um, and whatever the Lord's been doing, it's something that Dave and I both feel has deposited something in us that has changed us forever. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you for welcoming us so incredibly as a family. Um, and uh, I think even though we'll be back over there, it will always be hard because we'll always be split between two places. And that's difficult. But maybe the Lord's building a bridge. Maybe he's doing something that is to last a lot longer than, than just the time here. I mean, we're, we... We hope so. Even though it's goodbye, we'll be here again for sure. We'd love to come back. And um, So thank you very much. Um, thank you for the incredible part that you've played in our walk with the Lord. And thank you for releasing us so graciously as well. It means a huge amount. Um, we really, really love you. Um, and, uh, and we'll see you again for yes, sure. For sure. So, uh, it's, so for us, this, you said we're re releasing you graciously. It was with, um, found it weird that we had this voodoo shrine set up in uh, the corner of our room with look, dolls that look just like you, and it didn't, <laughs> didn't work. No, I'm just kidding. So we do, we do. So congregation, I know you guys are with us as well. If you would, could we just stretch out our hands and we just bless this family? So, Lord, we, we thank you, Father, for the gift of the Finch family, for Luke and Deb and, and each one of the girls. Lord, we thank you for the deposit that's been put in place into this house and the shift, 
Lord, we thank you, and Lord, we bless Luke, we bless Deb, we bless the girls. We honor them today, and Lord, we thank you, Father, for the next season, Lord, that you have brought into their lives. And Luke, I heard the Lord say that there is a recalibration going on, and that he's recalibrating you, that what, where you're stepping into the place that you're stepping in as you go back, that it's going to take you further and higher than you could have even imagined. So I bless you. I bless you and Deb to go up, to go up, up, up to the mountain, go higher. Lord, that they would soar. I pray, Father, that you would give them golden wings. Lord, we release golden wings. Lord, your glory, Lord, that would cause them to soar higher and exceed any expectation and any limitation that people have put on them. We break that off. In the name of Jesus, and we call forth an acceleration and an ex, uh, and, and a going up, Lord. We bless them to prosper in every area of your life. And I bless your feet that as you step in, that it would be a smooth transition. I bless Deb and the girls' uh, uh, transition that it would be easy. And Lord, we thank you, Father, that there is more joy, more life, more peace, more rest, more goodness, the graciousness of God, the mercy of God on your life coming in great measure. We bless you, and we bless, we bless your, uh, your hands and the, the sound that will come forth, and we bless the prophetic anointing on your life. We pray increase, increase, increase. Lord, we thank you for, um, we thank you, Lord, for the minstrel. Lord, we bless, we bless, we bless, and we call forth, Lord, a greater anointing, greater deposit into Luke's life and into Deb's life and into the girl's lives. We bless you. We bless your vision. Ha ha. We bless your vision. We bless it. In Jesus' name, revelation come forth. Thank you, Father. So I'm asking around to see if anybody else wants to pray, and they're all saying, no, I'm going to cry, and that's why I handed it off to Becky at first, but... But we do, I was just thinking about, there's a verse uh, in Scripture where Paul is talking about that he, as he was leaving, uh, he left a blessing. And uh, so I just say this over you. We commend you to the Lord. Yeah. We turn you over to the Lord. Not that we ever had you, but we bless and say this was a good time. This was a good visit. This was a good thing. Yeah. We speak all that Becky said over your family, over the girls, that we just speak over that, nothing lost. That's right. We pray that we just declare over you, Luke, that only goodness and only mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And may you always dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We love you. We thank you. We receive you, and now we release you. Yeah. Lord, would you be their front and their rear guard? Lord, we speak over you health and safety and an open door to come back. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And thank you, Deb, for those delicious cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> you introduced us to uh, English bakery. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. <laughs> Love you. Awesome. Awesome. Love you, Luke. <clears throat> well, here's the good news. Hey, I'm Josh. Sorry, as we knock over Luke Finch. <laughs> we need to get some wheels on this thing. Or magnets so it can levitate and float. We, here's the good news. We happen to be in the middle of a, a conference, the Moore Conference that Luke has been playing at and uh, our dear friend Chris McClarney. And although this is the last Sunday that Luke is playing at, it's not the last time he's leading worship his farewell concert will be tomorrow at 1 p.m. <laughs> he will be leading worship tomorrow. If you haven't been able to make it out to any of the conference sessions, we'd love you to come. You, there's still some sessions this evening. It um, uh, starts tonight at 7 p.m. And then tomorrow at 1 p.m. we kick off again. Luke will be leading and our guest speaker, who I'm going to introduce in a second, uh, will also be speaking there. But there's another event that's happening tomorrow that I'd love to invite you to. Tomorrow uh, afternoon at 3 o'clock, we are throwing a Memorial Day picnic. This is for everybody, so you don't have to be a conference attendee to come. 
uh, we have, uh, are going to transform the big grassy area out beside the firehouse. We've got some live music. We've got three fantastic food trucks coming. We've got uh, loaded burgers. We've got amazing Mexican food. And we've got Jenny's ice cream coming. And we'd love to invite you to bring your friends, your family, uh, bring some blankets, some, uh, some lawn games, and uh, just come and enjoy some time of fellowship and friendship tomorrow. Uh, it's absolutely uh, free to attend. Uh, we'd love you to be there. And then tomorrow night, which is normally m and but tomorrow will be our last session of the conference. It's free for everybody to attend. So we'd love you to come out. Uh, it will be an absolutely amazing time. If you have uh, missed a conference, then you won't have met this gentleman, uh, David Campbell, who is going to be our speaker this morning. I'm going to bring him up in a second. But uh, David is a dear friend of Age and I's. We met him a number of years ago through Toronto. Uh, he's very good friends with John and Carol Arna. has spoken at the church there many, many times. And in his normal day job, he happens to oversee about 140 churches back in London where he lives, uh, uh, oversees these churches all over the UK. He's part of the national leadership team for a large network and denomination of churches in the UK. Uh, he's very, very funny. He's very, uh, got a long, rich history with God. Uh, and he was sharing some stuff this morning that was just incredible. And uh, he's going to be speaking again tomorrow. But could we welcome David as he comes to minister this morning? And just want to say welcome to Grace Center, David. Welcome here. Let's pray for David as he ministers. Father, thank you for sending us David, Lord. I thank you for uh, just his uh, willingness to come, Lord, interrupt his very crazy schedule to make room for us, Lord. And uh, we bless you, David, just as a friend of the house and just welcome you in here. So just come and minister. Lord, would you open our hearts, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that understand and receive revelation. So thank you for this dear friend. Uh, we welcome you, David. Amen. Is that better? <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. I'm having a great fun here. Um, I've never been to Nashville, Tennessee before, so I put on my John, Johnny Cash outfit <laughs> just to make you all feel I think I have to do something to fit in here. And um, actually, they told me that black makes you look thinner. So one of the gent outfits is that says, have you got a deep black shirt, please? because I need all the help I can get. And because um, I'm quite big, you know, so if I'm thinking like about America, I can find clothes that fit me. <laughs> it's just nice not to be the biggest person around. In fact, um, um, <clears throat> you're going to have to get used to me because I don't really take life that In fact, somebody said that um, um, f- people who feel, to people who feel life is a tragedy, to people who think life is a comedy, and I think I'm an intellectual because I think life's really funny, <laughs> really, really funny. But um, I am a bit worried because I've been trying to lose weight. And I saw, I saw Chris pray here. And I thought, you don't see as much of him as you used to these days, have we? <laughs> I thought, I didn't recognize him. His daughter's sitting next to him, so that was nice. <laughs> and, um, but I'm a bit worried because I think, I, think I think I'm anorexic. <laughs> So if you're PC, if you don't like the, if you're religious, you won't like this. I'm sorry, but uh, just go get a coffee. <laughs> I'll tell you why, because I read in a newspaper, I said, it must be true. I read in a newspaper, one of the first signs of being anorexic is that every time you look in the mirror, you think you see a fat person. <laughs> and I am in the first stages of anorexia. And I'm just fighting this off at the moment, so I'd, I'd appreciate your prayers and your help, and that's really good. But that's, I'm going to thank you. It's not my last session, but it's my first and last session. But actually, it might be my last session. But um, I just wanted to thank uh, Alan and AJ for inviting me. We've sort of known each other for years and years, and, and um, I come to people, I don't go to churches, you know what I mean? I'm, we're very relational and, and stuff. Uh, so when they asked me to come, I said, yeah, yeah. I didn't know where Nashville was. I didn't realize it was so far. <laughs> they sort of built it the wrong place. 
But did you see me, Jeff and Beggy? Thank you so much. I feel like I've known you for ages and ages and ages, and just feel so at home here. So thank you, everybody. You've got a nice church here. You've got a nice church, and I just I was sharing with Jeff because when a lot of change comes to a church, it's all about thinking. Oh, I just felt the Lord was saying to me as we were sharing, "It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right." So just relax a little bit. In fact, if you're sort of feeling a bit tired this morning um, and you fall asleep, let me tell you what to say to the person next to you. I, was, I didn't fall asleep. I felt the Lord wanted to give me a dream and I was just sort of making myself available. <laughs> so that'd be a good thing to do, wouldn't it? Because I want to talk to you today about just hearing as sons and daughters. And because I think God changes you when you become a Christian. Your life's never the same again. And um, I'm a third-generation Pentecostal. That's who I am. My grandmother was saved in 1926 in the Pentecostal outpouring in, in Scotland. Because uh, I'm from Scotland. Hey. Thank you. Waves of spontaneous apathy hit me there, but that was good. <laughs> My granny was saved under the minister of a man called George Jeffries, who was a Pentecostal pioneer and... And um, they started the Elam Pentecostal Church. My dad was um, a Pentecostal preacher. I'm a Pentecostal pastor, one of the national leaders of our denomination. One of my daughters is married to a pastor, so she's fourth generation. And so we're really in a rut in our family. We've been in the same ministry for 100 years, really. <laughs> but we're getting there. We're getting there. And, and, and uh, I just love coming across the world and finding people of the same heart and the same spirit. So thank you very much. But... Um, I'd like to read from the Bible. Um, if you've got a Bible, if, you, if you're under 30, this is a Bible. <laughs> this is what we used to use in the old days. It's got pages. When I was a child growing up in church, you know, you, I noticed people that get their phones out, they get their iPads out, and they say they're reading their Bibles. You think, yeah, just have to believe that, don't you? When I was a kid, the only the most exciting thing was the, was the maps at the back. And they didn't, didn't even have the proper names in it. And forgive me, America isn't in the Bible. <laughs> it's not there. It's kept hidden, secret. So did I tell you where we're going? John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 27. I read from the born again King James. The New King James. So verse 27 of chapter 12 of John's Gospel. And Jesus is speaking out loud. And he says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now the judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. And this he said, signifying by what death he would die. Amen. God bless his word. I share in, in the pastor's meeting, say, I, I always tell pastors, you must read the Bible in church because at least something you said will be inspired. <laughs> and I love the Bible. I'd encourage you to read the Bible. I think we're living in a very non-literate age where people don't read anything, they don't read newspapers, they don't read anything that, sh that, anything that doesn't fit on a, sort of a, a small screen of a telephone that we don't have the patience with. But this isn't, this isn't a book, this is life. So I encourage you to read it. So it's really, 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 really good. There's only three times in the Bible where the, we hear the Father's voice speaks about Jesus, only three times. One at his baptism, one at his transfiguration, and now. And so this is significant. And I just thought, this isn't, this isn't the sermon, this is free, just you know, buy one, get one free, and this is the free bit. 
Every time the Father spoke about Jesus, he said something real nice. Now, that's fairly easy with Jesus. But I'm going to say to you, mums and dads, when you talk about your kids to other people, you want to make sure you say positive things about them. Because you've got, you've got the dirt on your kids. You know, when somebody says, oh, you've got a lovely daughter, oh, you've got a lovely son, you say, you should see that bedroom. Whoa, dear me. But actually, actually, that's not for them. Because because you might know things about them, but trust me, they know things about you. <laughs> and you want to begin to speak positive things over, not ignoring the negative, but speak well of them, speak what you want them to become, and be honour them in that way. And the Father honours the Son. So anyway, this is really interesting, because in this story, Jesus is speaking, and then they, they, they hear a voice from heaven. And this is what it says. Some said... It thundered. Some said an angel was speaking to Jesus. Jesus answered and said, the Father is trying to speak to you. Now then, here's the question. Who's telling the truth? Now, if you've been to Sunday school, you know the answer is Jesus. In fact, the answer to every question in Sunday school is Jesus so Jesus, I want to suggest to you, actually, maybe, I think they're all telling the truth. I think they're all saying, some heard thunder. Some thought they heard an angel speak. But Jesus is saying, actually, this is the Father who's trying to speak to you. And I want to get the point by the time we've finished of just hearing how the Father speaks to us. How we can always hear the Father speak rather than just a noise in heaven. Because maybe... Maybe what you hear tells more about you than it says about the voice. Maybe how you respond to when God says, it tells me more about where you are and what you're doing than anything else. Like someone said it thundered. When I was even younger than I am now, a little boy grew up in Scotland, um, um, my mum didn't like thunder and lightning, she was scared of it. She tried to pretend to us she wasn't, but every time there was a thunderstorm, she'd close the curtains, close the blinds, and hide under the bed. So we knew, we knew that she was nervous of it, and she tried not to be. And it was then, my mum, when we said, Mum, what, what is thunder? Because thunder thunder's just a noise in heaven. It's just, a, it's just a, 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 a scary noise up there somewhere. And my mum told me, so it must be true, my mum taught me thunder is when God's moving the furniture around in heaven. I was 26 before I found out that's not true. <laughs> it sounds good to me. Because it's almost like it's a distant noise. It's something which is away from me. It's nothing to do with me, but it's slightly scary. And sometimes God's voice can be a bit like that. It's just a, a little bit scary. It, it, it's just a noise and you're frightened and you don't know what it's about. Can I think about Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve are the first couple in the world. Can you, can you imagine a marriage, a husband and wife being together with the in laws? Wouldn't that be glorious and wonderful? And they had a wonderful existence. And the Bible says that they used to walk with God in the cool of the evening. I don't know about you, but I like the cool of the evening. My wife and I, we have quite busy lives. My, my wife, she raises funds for, a chari for charities to look after the orphans. And, uh, and, and, and if, she was, if she was here, she'd just stand up and cry, and you'd give her money. That's the way it works, really. In fact, I could never get her to preach. I could never get her to say anything. I couldn't get her to give her an announcement. And then God touched her heart for the orphans and the fatherless. And, and now she travels everywhere, raising hundreds of thousands of pounds just to give away. I wish you'd get a job that paid money. That's what I'd like, but, but, uh, but uh, that's a good show. So, so we love each other and we have, we have very, very busy lives. But especially when, if the weather's nice enough, at the end of the day, we can sit outside, you know, in your yard and you're just relaxing, having a glass of whatever you think Jesus allows you to have. <laughs> and just relaxing. I'm from Europe the way it is. So was Jesus. <laughs> just work it out yourself. 
And we love that time when we just talk, how's your day, how's it been? And we catch things up and we say, what's this you've stuck in the diary? All those sort of things, we do that. And it's a great time of day. And Adam and Eve would be working in the garden. They were gardeners. They, um, they were very green. They had everything all sorted out. But they, the highlight in their day was they would hear the presence of God come. And they said, he's here. And I don't know if they go running to him. I know, like, you know, when my kids were young, they used to come running and jump on me. When they got into their teenage years, I asked them to stop it. I said, <laughs> my back went. I just loved it. And I just wondered, Adam, me, well, come on, come on, it's time. He's here. His presence is here. Till one day, one day everything was very different. When Adam and Eve heard the presence of God coming, they, they didn't come running from, towards him. They went to hide away from him. Because something had happened that day. Something had happened that made them want to hide. Because they'd had a discussion. And there was a snake came in the garden. I mean, the snake was Satan. And the snake said to, to Eve, did God say you can't eat of all the trees in the garden? She said, no, he didn't say that. He said, we're not to eat the one in the middle. And Satan said to her, that's because God knows if you eat of that tree, you become like him, knowing both good and evil. I want you to hold that thought in your mind. That's Genesis chapter 3. Now, most people have read Genesis. Because I find that Christians are pretty much like this. Every January, they decide they're going to read through the Bible. And then you sort of hit Exodus. And by the time you hit Leviticus, you think, oh, there's always next year. <laughs> but we've all read Genesis. So Genesis 3. If you do this, you become like God. Remember that. Genesis chapter 1. I think it's verse 26 or 27. I can't remember. The Bible says, God said, let us make man in our image. So God says, I'm going to make you in my image. Chapter 1. I'm shattered. Chapter 3. If you do this, you'll become like... God doesn't want you to do this, because if you do this, you become like him. Chapter 3. Chapter 1. Are you, are you getting this? You are made in my image. But here's another question. Which comes first? Chapter 1. Or chapter three. This is deep, isn't it? Do you want to phone a friend? Or are you getting this? You see, when you forget in whose image you are made, you will believe any lie that you're told. And when Adam and Eve forgot who they were, they actually tried to become less than what they were created to be. The day you forget who God's made you to be, that you are called to be in his image, you will try to make up for it in another way, which takes away the gift that God has given to you. And they tried to hide. Can you imagine hiding from God? I'm... See if you're nicer in this service than the first service. But you're going to find this hard to believe, but I'm a granddad. That was slightly better. <laughs> I'm a granddad. I've got two beautiful granddaughters. And um, actually, both my daughters are pregnant right now. And uh, so we've got two grandchildren. And one of them's going to have a baby in a month's time. And the other one's going to have twins in sort of two months' time. So we were going from two grandchildren to five. I said to my wife, last Christmas we had two grandchildren in our house. This year we'll have five grandchildren in our house. I'm coming here for Christmas. <laughs> I think a lot, a lot of, but I'll tell you that because Lily Eden, she's two, and she's, 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 she's the, the granddaughter belonging to the pastors. My daughter's the pastor. And she plays hide and seek. It's great to play hide and seek with a two year old because this is what she does. Me go, Oh, where's Lily gone? Where's Lily gone? She goes, <laughs> And then she takes her hands away. We go, Oh, there you are. And it's, it's great. There's zero effort has to be put in. <laughs> it's one, I can play it all day. I go, Oh, there you are. What I think is great is when I go that, I go, She goes, Oh, where's granddad gone? I thought, oh, Thank you. <laughs> 
Adam's hiding. Adam's hiding. And it's almost, he thinks God can't see him. Do you know, sometimes there comes time in all our lives that we lose all of our IQ in one go. We think that God doesn't know what we're doing in secret. We think, if I don't tell him, he won't know. Or if I don't tell him, he won't bring it up. But just keep it off the agenda. And then God comes looking for Adam. He says, Adam, where, where are you? Now, I don't think, you know, I don't think God was going, oh, where are you, Adam? Are you under the apple tree? No, we're not under the apple tree. I don't think he's doing that. He's saying, Adam, I wonder if you're behind the fifth tree on the left. No, I don't think he did that. It's almost an out idiom. It would be, where are you at? Not just where are you, where are you at? What are you doing, Adam? Why are you hiding from the all-seeing, all-knowing God? Why? Because the voice that sounded like many waters that came for a blessing today sounds like thunder. Why? Because he's in a different place. He's hearing the same voice, the same presence, but his life's not right. And I'm going to say gently to you, you might be visiting today or you might come to this church every week, but actually the, the thought of seeing God face to face scares you silly because it's like thunder but when you're his child the fear goes away when you're in a right relationship with him the fear goes away i just watch the time because i like telling stories do you like stories let me tell you another story let me tell you a granddad's story because see sometimes it almost hiding it feels like god hides from us and this time, Adam was hiding from God. When my daughter, my youngest daughter, who's now 25, so we're going back into the last century, actually the last millennium, when she was four years old, she had a little friend who used to come to our house and they played hide and seek. You play hide and seek, do you? And one day, so we're playing and I said, okay, um, I would close my eyes and go, one, two, three, miss a few, a million, right, I'm coming to fetch you, ready or not, here I come, and I'd have to go and look for them. And the two little girls, they just giggle, you don't need to know where they are. They just go, oh, are you up the chimney? No, you're not up the chimney. Are you in the cup? No, you're not. Are you under the tip? No, you're not. And I go, oh, there you are, and go, ah, and then it's my turn to hide. This is where it gets more difficult. Because you have to have rules with small children, you can't... They can't go to the room, for example, you have to stay in the room. Because if I want to win this game, I say, right, you close your eyes, sneak out, jump in the car and drive off. And I win. Because <laughs> trust me, if I don't want them to find me, they won't find me. So I'm hiding. And then because they're little, I had to count as well, which makes it harder. So I'm going, one, two, three, throw my voice around the room. Just try and make it harder for them. But then I have to decide where to hide, which is, I'm six foot four and full of muscles. <laughs> I have the body of an athlete. I've wrapped it in fat just to keep it in good condition at the moment because I don't want it to stop that good. So I'm, I'm, I think, where will I go? And, and I, I thought I could hide under the table, but that's so awkward. And I'd once hidden behind the settee, but I got stuck. And my wife had to come and get me out and she took... They told the whole church, it was just very embarrassing. So I just hid behind the curtain. I thought, that's easy, I just hide behind the curtain. Which is great, because then you're hiding there, and my feet are sticking out the bottom. And the curtain comes down like that. And so you sort of, I know I'm there, and I say, right, come and get me, ready or not. And I've got to tell you, if you're a big, strong person like me, you want to play hide and seek with a four-year-old. Because the place is the look for you. That's lovely. I saw them open a little cupboard and say, is daddy in there? I go, oh, thank you. Thank you. I love you. You lovely children. Thank you so much. And they looked under the table. Is daddy there? And I, I thought, well, soon, soon. And actually, after a while, they didn't find me. We don't live in a very big house. Think, well, where are they? So I went, eh, eh, eh. They still didn't find me. So I peeked from behind the curtain. And they were sitting down watching TV. 
they'd forgotten me. I said, Daddy could have died in there. You know, it's like you open your cupboard and a skeleton falls out. You say, hide and seek champion, 1957. There he is. Why am I saying that? Because um, I'll try and tie it back into the sermon. The reason I hide was not to hide from them, but to hide for them. If I didn't want them to find me, they would never find me. But it appears as if God is hiding from you. He's not hiding from you. He's hiding for you. If he didn't want you to find him, you never would. But he says, if you seek me with all your heart, I will be found of you. So it's time to keep seeking him and time to keep going. But if your heart's not right, you will try to hide from him. The second group of people said, not the thunder, but it's an angel but it's speaking, to, it's speaking to Jesus. An angel speaking to Jesus. That's what's happening. And that's interesting too because um, it's almost what they're saying. It's supernatural, but it's not for me. It's, I think God's on the move here, but it's not for It's possible to come to a church and actually think God is doing great things. And this great church, the more I get to know this church, the more I like it. I can see why you stay. I just think it's great. You could come to this church and actually think everything that happens is for somebody else. It's like the man at the Pool of Bethesda. It's the same book um, earlier on in John's Gospel, John chapter 5. It's a sort of strange story, if you've ever read this, the story of the man at the Pool of Bethesda, because what it says was, and on the, on one of the ways then, say from there to this door, that's the way into the temple, uh, on this side is a pool called the Pool of Bethesda. It's not that big, it'd be smaller than this room. And this, what the, the Bible says, so it's not just a story, it's, it's a re- report, that every so often an angel would come down and would trouble the waters. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it's a, you know, too. I don't know what, he troubled the waters. I don't know what he did. But somehow they, they maybe frothed it up or something or put his foot in it. And, and, and the first person in the water got healed. It sounds a bit strange story to me, but actually the Bible said it happened. And this man in the story, he was there for 38 years. You don't hang around for 38 years unless something's happening. And Jesus comes up to this man because whatever disease they had was healed. And the Bible says this man had been infirm for 38 years. It doesn't say he's lame. I think he was lame because he was lying in the bed and he couldn't get to the water. So that gives you an idea. Just imagine this man has been lying in a place where you can get healed Wanting to be healed for 38 years, three, eight years. You got it? And Jesus comes and he says to this man, do you want to be healed? Now don't tell Jesus I said this. I think that's rude. Can you imagine like, I don't know, we have Wimbledon in, in England and people go to see the tennis. My wife loves the tennis and I just... She comes back like that. But, um, people queue up or line up. You line up, don't you hear? It's my international language. They actually sleep outside for days to get to the front of the line so they can go in and watch a game of tennis. But can you imagine somebody slept outside for three days and the security man sees them every night and then says to them one day, did you want to come in? Jesus says to someone who's been waiting, not three days, but 38 years, did you want to be healed? Now, we're too polite, and God is listening, so we're too polite to say that's a bit naughty. But actually, when you think about it, that is a very perceptive statement of Jesus. Because, for example, only the first person in gets healed. That's what we said. If you were a lame person, and you were at a, a, a lake, or a pond, or somewhere, and the f- only the first person in gets healed, where would you be sitting? You'd be sitting by the water. I'd be sitting in the water, just have my foot in and out all the time, just in case it happened and I didn't notice. 
Where's this man sitting? By the water? No, he's over there. He's where he gets the money. It's possible to come to church and actually sit and observe everything that's happening and not be at the water's edge where heaven touches earth. It's possible to actually come to church and actually think I'm a part of what's happening, but you're in no danger whatsoever of actually getting a, a touch that will transform your life. And we have to... Jesus says, that's interesting. And I wonder too, because I think this was one of the best begging sites in the whole of Jerusalem. In fact, probably the whole country. Because what happened, when you went on a pilgrimage to the temple... You give, you would give part of it. You give money to beggars, and a lot of people liked people to see them do it. And so sometimes they wait, or maybe they're Scottish, and they waited to the last minute before they gave away their money. So this man, where he was going, was one of the best places in all Israel, because um, people had to give alms. They got it. In fact, he's unfortunate. This man's begging for arms, but he needed legs. So he's upset. <laughs> and he's waiting there, and people would give him money. He's in one of the best sites. So wonder, do you really want to be healed? Where, where I live in St. Albans in England, um, I live near London. And we, we have um, something which people can sell, uh, like a, a magazine, people who are homeless or people who are down on the farm, they can sell this, and, and it's called The Big Issue. And they, they get it cheap and they sell it at a profit, and that helps just helps them get along. And there's a man there in St. Albans who I've known for years, and he sells The Big Issue. And I remember saying to him one day, you've got a great spot here. He stands beside an ATM. He stands beside a cash dispenser. Do you call them ATMs? So you can never say, I haven't got any money. So I said, you've got, you got a great spot. He said, yeah, it's good. He said, it's the second best spot in the whole of St. Albans. Now, I don't know about you, but as soon as he says it's the second best, I want to know where the best is. Not because I'm looking for a career change, but I just thought it'd be nice to know that. I said, well, where's the best place? He said, it's across there, that shop called Marks and Spencer's which is where posh people buy the food. And, and I said, well, why, why don't you go over there? He says, well, that's Mary's spot. I said, who's Mary? He said, she's been doing it the longest. So that's hers. She's the top of the street. She's, she, and he said, when Mary dies, I'm going to move over there. He's the only person in St. Albans is praying for Mary to die. <laughs> that's very interesting. This man's in the best spot. And, and he's an official beggar. Because like the chap that sells the big issue, he's got a badge that says he's allowed to sell it. You, no one's just allowed to do it. He, he, this man, he would have like a stole around his shoulders or, a, or, or, or it might even be a cape. But it was officially given to him by the temple. And it meant this man was really, it was, that limp was real. That man he is really blind and he's licensed to beg. Because if you remember blind Bartimaeus... That was the blind Bartimaeus. When he, heard, when he heard Jesus was coming, he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. He took his cloak and he left it behind. That man was making a huge statement of faith. He was saying, this is my authority to beg. I'm going to leave this down because if I get to Jesus, I ain't begging anymore. This blind man is going to see. But this lame man is hugging his Stole around his shoulders. And if he gets healed, he will be unemployed. And he's, if he's been begging for 38 years, you had to be 12 before you'd be allowed on the premises. So he could have been up to 50 years old, which is young these days. 50's a new 30. But in his time, 50 was above the average life expectancy of a man. So he's had a good life somehow. He's lived longer than people who are working really hard with their hands. But he'll be unemployed. And more than that, he might lose his identity. Because I've been thinking again, because this man in St. Albans, I don't know his name. No, I did know his name. 
because he's got a badge. And it's a bit like church. You ever come to church, you meet somebody, hi, hi, I'm, I'm David, how are you? And they, say, they tell you your name. You think, that's great. Next week you say, Chill, what was your name again? And they tell you. But if your memory's like mine, by week three, you think, hi, brother, <laughs> sister. And for the next 20 years, you don't call them anything because you don't like to ask them what their name is. And in St. Albans, I've asked lots of people, what's his name? He's got a badge, but actually, you need to be very rude and come right up with my eyesight. You have to go right up to see what it is. So I don't know what his name is. He's just the man that, if I said, you know the guy that sells the big issue by the ATM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If this man who begs by the pool of Bethesda, if he's healed, who will he be? If the problems, the difficulties which you have in your life, if God touches you and transforms you and you're no longer that person with those problems, who are you going to be? And some people prefer to keep the problem and the security of the problem they know than the fear of the freedom they don't. So Jesus actually says to him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be touched by the power of the Holy Ghost today? If so, how close are you to the edge? Are you living near the edge? Are you living where the water touches the earth? And it's interesting because Jesus says to this man, do you want to be healed? It's what they call monosyllabic. So when you talk to your children sometimes, will you please be quiet? Actually, that's two syllables, but you know what I mean. And this is so simple that Jesus, it's what they call a closed question. Because the question is, do you want to be healed? Answer yes or answer no. Does that make sense? So Jesus says to him, do you want to be healed? And you know what he says? Something like this. He says... Sir, sir, I have no mind to put me in the water. When the waters are stirred, lo, somebody jumps in before me. Somebody else is in front of me. Somebody else is, I think, if I was Jesus, I'd be going, I don't think that's why I asked you. Basically, what the man is saying is this. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault that I'm not healed. Do you know in this church, nobody helps you. I've been here for 38 years. Every time the water stirred, they help their mates. They help everybody else. I'm sitting here. I'm on my own. Don't you start picking on me. It's not my fault. How dare you come in here and say I'm lame because it's my fault. It's not my fault. Nobody helps me. If I was Jesus, I'd be going, okay. <laughs> Anybody else who want to be healed? <laughs> Anyone else? You've got an attitude problem. You need counselling. I'll come back in 10 years and sort you out. The Bible says that Jesus answered him. And said, take up your bed and walk. Aren't you pleased that Jesus didn't answer him at all? He didn't answer him at all. In my opinion, he didn't answer him at all. He didn't answer what came out of his mouth. He answered what was in his heart. I am so grateful that God's not answered all my prayers. First, I'll tell you the story again, because some of you know R.T. Kendall. Well, we've got him over in England at the moment. He's, he's actually... Um, got credentials with our denomination and he's at Kensington Temple at the moment and I had lunch with him just four or five weeks ago and, uh, <clears throat> but he tells a great story of thank God for unanswered prayer and he said that one day he received an email or something from a lady who he knew when he was at college was it college? She was like the most beautiful girl in the whole place. And he'd fallen deeply in love with her. And he wanted to ask her out. And basically, long story short, she broke his heart. Dumped him, we would say. And just left him. And now, 50 years later, she contacts him. And says, RT, we've followed your career. And it's great what God has done. And... and, um, my husband and I would love just to meet up with you and your wife, Louise, and just say hi. And understand you're going to be such such a place we could meet in this airport and get together. So R.T. said to Louise, his wife, 
how do you feel about that? And she basically said, how do I feel about meeting your old flame? Okay. Okay, he said, well, be rude not to. She said, he did. Now then, I'm not sure how to say this because we're in different cultures, but basically, there are some people who, as they get older, the years are very kind to them. <laughs> then there's some people that the years have been extremely vindictive to. And when R.T. and Louise met this lady and her husband, this lady was in the latter category. <laughs> where old man time had really had a bad day with her. And he said, as they finished the meal, they are all been nice, as he walked away from this childhood sweetheart who had broken his heart, he was holding Louise's hand and he said, praise God for unanswered prayer. And I want to tell you, sometimes when you pray things, God doesn't say no. He goes, no, no, you've no idea. The answer is no, you silly person. No, never, ever. You don't know what you're doing. I've seen what that would be like in fifth. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> because God wants to meet you exactly where you are because he loves you and he cares for you just as you are and my, the problem is that often we don't think we're good enough I don't think many Christians think they're better than they really are there's a few but they do stand out because most Christians put themselves down and I, mean, I don't want God to answer all my prayers I've never asked God for justice do you know what I hear kids say it's not fair well I never say that to God because I don't want justice. I don't want what I deserve. I want mercy. James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And I said, God, have mercy on me all the time. I'm in for mercy because... There are days I feel I'm a really good Christian. In fact, some days I think I'm in the top quarter percentile. And then there's the, the other 360-something, but I don't feel that. I mean, do you ever, I mean, don't put your hand up because it has been streamed. Do you ever feel that you're not doing very well as a Christian? I mean, do you ever think, do you know, I think I'm the worst Christian here? Because if you think about it, somebody is. <laughs> Still funny, sir. <laughs> maybe we could have a competition we could have sort of like state competition if you'd like to nominate someone if you write their name and address in a hundred dollar note and pass it forward to me we'll see what we can do but Jesus is saying listen don't hear for everybody else I want you to hear for yourself so hearing his sons means you don't hear fear when the Father's coming, even when you've done wrong. Because when you're a child and you've done wrong, you don't run away from your dad. You come back and say, Dad, I'm really sorry. Before mum tells you, I just want to tell you, I broke your whatever. He goes, all right. No pocket money for 15 years, but that's okay. Because I'm not afraid of my heavenly father. You may be afraid of your earthly father, but your heavenly father, he's looking for excuses to bless you. He's looking to make you the person you were always meant to be. Because the second thing is, when, when the father speaks, you know he's speaking to you. Because he always speaks to you. And you're used to his voice. And you want to hear what he says, so it can transform and change your life. Because I want to just give one more point, because Jesus said, the father's speaking for your sake he wants you to hear as sons because there's something amazing happens when grace changes your life and and, and i'd love to unpick it a bit more but it's almost like see grace is not god saying to you you can do what you like now you're a christian you can sin as much as you like but paul actually said what should we do should we sin so that grace shall abound he goes oh no in fact the jb phillips says oh what a ghastly thought that's an English translation for you. 
So we're not saved to sin, we're saved from sin. But when you come under the grace of God, legalism has to go. Religion has to go. Why? Because we're not under law, we're under grace. We're not under regulation, we're in relationship. But what does relationship mean? Relationship means that we've gone from being his commandments changed into promises. Let me tell you what, let me give you an example of that. This is the last story, so stay with me. Many years ago, the story is told of a young boy whose parents died. And for no fault of his own, he was left on the streets fending for himself. In a country that, didn't, that in those days wouldn't have had any social services or people, the government to help. So he'd have to look after himself. And so I guess basically what he did, he stole food. I don't condone stealing, but almost, in this instance, I almost do. I think if he'd come to my house, he wouldn't have had to steal. We'd have fed him. We'd have, probably in your house too. But that's not what he found. He found nobody wanted him. So he stole. And then he found out he was good at stealing. And as he fell out a bit, he would, he would steal from people in the streets. And he, would became, he became an undesirable person. Do you know, there comes a point in life when you stop keeping bad company, and you become bad company. But he crossed that line and he travelled some. And he was the sort of person, by the time we hit this story, he's in his late 30s and you would avoid him. If you saw him coming down the street, you would feel led by Jesus to go across and look at something else. Because he just made you uncomfortable by his physical presence. And he was particularly good at breaking into people's homes when they weren't there and taking their possessions. It may be in your house now, as you sit here. No, no, that's a long story. <laughs> and so he's a nasty person. But a little old lady met him. I love little old ladies. I love, you know, it's almost, I, I, some pastors painted like the old people in our church, they're resisting God. I've never found that. I've found that people, as they get older in life, are more desperate for a move of God to think, for goodness sake, pastor. Sometimes they say to me, David, can't you get us a pastor with a bit more go about him? Because if the, if the revival is going to come, it's going to have to be soon. I'm 85, for goodness sake, get rid of that man and get something. It's like, okay, okay. And this little old lady was like that, ah, she's a firebrand. And she, she witnesses it to him in the street and says, excuse me, young man, do you know there's a God in heaven who loves you? He goes, what? And he didn't think anybody loved him. He'd never heard the gospel. He could hardly read and write. He says, there's a God in heaven who loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you, that if you will ask him to forgive you, he'll take away every sin you've ever committed. And the man says, oh, I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of bad things. She looked him in the eye and said, I can believe that. But Jesus died for every single one of them. Now, young man, you need to give your life to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit touched his heart right there that Saturday evening. And he felt tears come to his eyes. And he prayed the prayer. And he gave his life to Jesus. And after the prayer, the little old lady said, Now, listen, young man, you go to church tomorrow morning. Do you understand? He goes, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But listen, you go to church tomorrow. Promise? Yeah, I promise. Promise. Because he was a scary man, but she's a much more scary old lady. <laughs> Next day, he needs to go to church. Now, he he's never been to church. He's never even been thrown out of a church. He's not been in one yet. But he thinks he knows what church looks like. And forgive me, he probably wouldn't have found Grace Centre, because what he's looking for is a church with a steeple. And it's in Europe, so, you know, a church with a steeple and stained glass windows. Probably an old building. Stained glass windows in a steeple. And he knows where there's one because he'd been on the roof once to take some of the lead away. So he, he knew where it was. So he went back to the church. And he's standing outside and he's a bit hesitant going in because he sees everyone in this church. They're all dressed in suits and ties and really well dressed. And I said, I, I, I had a tie. He took it back. It was too tight. And he's watching these people coming in. And he just sneaked in the back and sat at the back, feeling slightly uncomfortable. In fact, he thought he recognised a couple of folks. He thought, I'm sure that's a policeman. I'm sure he's arrested me. And he looked over and thought, I recognise that family. 
Oh, I've been in their house. And the service started. He knew none of the songs. Visitors know none of the songs. He didn't, couldn't sing them anyway. He just feel very uncomfortable. And I guess when you're a bit disengaged, you just look around, don't you? And this church, the stained glass windows, in the olden days, they would have pictures and the, the vicar or the pastor would point to one once a week and they'd tell the story, maybe it'd be a, of the Good Shepherd or something. But this church had the Ten Commandments round the windows. Now, some of you are ahead of me already. Just wait for me. It's my story and I do want to finish it. And as he sat there thinking, oh, I'm very uncomfortable here. I'm, I'm not coming here again. The light shone through the window and hit him in the face. Just the warmth and sun. And as he turned towards this window, one of the Ten Commandments was illuminated to him. Can you guess which one of the Ten Commandments shone in his face? Thou shalt not steal. How do you think he felt right then? What do you think was his reaction? Let me tell you. He went, wow, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. Why? Because he'd never heard of the Ten Commandments. He thought, God has just told me I will never steal again. Because grace doesn't exempt you from the commandments. It changes it from being a commandment to being A promise. So the answer that grace says you can do what you like is totally wrong. You just like what you're doing. That's what changes the heart. You don't do what you like. You like what you're doing, what is righteous. Let me finish. I'm going to give you ten promises out of the Bible. See if you've heard of these. You find them in Exodus chapter 20. Here's a promise for you. Number one, you you will have no other gods before me. You won't. Trust me. This is a promise. You once you've met the living God, you don't want anything else. You you just why would you go back to anything else? You won't. You won't. You won't. That's a promise. It's not a commandment now. It's a promise. You won't do that. You won't do it. You won't make false images. Once you've met the living God, why are you going to go chop down a tree and make an idol? You're not going to do it. It's like when you've got a full screen 3D television and somebody says, I've got an old black and white set. Do you want to buy it? You go, no, thank you. I'll give it to the church. <laughs> Sorry, that's one of my other things. I can't get into that. It's, real, it's wicked. You will not take the name of the Lord your God. You won't take the name of the Lord in vain. Why? Because we love that name. I, I, that's a promise to me. Lord, I won't take your name in vain. I'll take your name. It's, very, it's the name which is above every name. It's the name that sets the captives free. It's the name that brings the presence of God into my life. I won't be taking that name in vain. You will have a Sabbath day. You will learn to enter into my rest. That doesn't mean Sabbatarianism. That's what learning to enter into his rest. You will. You will honor your father and your mother. I'll give you love for your parents. And let me just say to you, some people find that quite a hard one. But just because your parents were bad parents doesn't mean you have to be a bad child. Hear me? God will give you the ability to forgive. Now, there's a difference between, there's things which, which how do you put this? There's, there's many things which are inexcusable, but there's nothing that's unforgivable. We're not asking you to excuse bad behavior. We're saying you need to forgive bad behavior. The problem about forgiveness is you can only give it to people who don't deserve it. If somebody deserves forgiveness, there's nothing to forgive. You can only forgive people who have done wrong and who don't deserve forgiveness. So if honouring your parents means you have to forgive them, 
he'll help you with that too. And the way he helps you about doing that is he just shows you how much you've been forgiven. And suddenly it's not so hard. Suddenly we can help. He says, you, you won't murder anyone. Hallelujah. I'm glad that's a promise. <laughs> My wife and I have been married 33 years. And she says, you know, in all these years, she's never, ever considered divorce or leave me even once. Murder a few times, but she's never considered divorce. <laughs> but you won't murder anyone. Why? Because he has given the Spirit of God inside you to control that temper. He's given you the ability to, to forgive the unforgivable. He's given you the, the ability to love the unlovely. He's given you the ability to let go of all those things. This commandment becomes a promise. If you struggle with someone, I'll give you the ability to deal with it. It feels like there's more than 10 of these, isn't it? You won't go and commit adultery. You won't. No, you won't. No, you won't. Why? Because I'll give you love for your husband. I'll give you love for your wife. Because actually, the father himself is involved in our, our marriage covenant. When we get married, my wife and I, it wasn't just the two of us that made a promise. We made our vows before God. He is involved in our marriage. And every day we pray together. Every day we read the Word of God together. Why? Number one, I like talking to my wife. And number two, I think our marriage includes God. And if I keep him in the center, most of our problems disappear. We haven't got them all finished yet because I'm fairly reasonable, but, you know, women can be... Anyway, right. <laughs> I hope she's not watching this. You won't steal. You won't... You, won't, you, you, shall, you shall not steal. Why? Because I am the Lord, your provider. I'll give you everything you need. And anything you don't need, I'll show you why you don't need it. I'll give you everything you ever want. I am Jehovah Jireh. I'm the Lord, your provider. You won't bear false witness. Why? Because I put the truth in your heart. I put the truth in your mouth. And the truth sets you free. Last one. You won't covet other people's possessions. Why? Because I'm going to bless you so much. Everybody else is going to be jealous of the people of God. His commands have become promises. Getting free of the law is coming into the grace to be able to, to not do what you like, but to like what you're doing. It's to be able to see that his commands are still to be kept, but they become promises to us. They're our inheritance. Paul put it this way, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So my prayer for you is that when you hear him coming in the cool of the night, you don't hear thunder, but you run to his presence. When he speaks, you won't say, oh, that blessing's for somebody else. You say, thank you, Father, that's for me. And you'll see that all his commands have turned into promises. Can we stand? Can we pray, please, just before we go? Again, thank you all so much for inviting me and let me come. And um, I've been so blessed. I want to pray over you. And I say, Father, I thank you. And just as we've got our heads bowed, I would like to ask, maybe, maybe you're here and quite honest with you and with me. The idea of God speaking to you is like thunder right now because you don't really know him. He's not your father. He's God, but he's, he's not your God yet. I would love to pray for you. This is what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to ask you to indicate to me you'd like me to pray for you. I'm not going to make you do anything else after that, okay? But if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and you like to say, I'd like to give my life to him now. I don't understand it all, but I just know this is the right thing for me. That that God who died and sent his, loved me so much, he sent his son to die on a cross for me like the man in the story. I, I thought about that. I thought that might be me. If you're here and you'd like me to pray, I'd like you to put your hand up until I see it and I'll acknowledge it and I'll pray for you before I pray for everybody else. But if you're here and you'd like to just say, I, I, I see it at the back, sir. I've got, thank you. I want it, thank you. One. Anybody else? Who else is there? 
to take a moment because this is the most important thing in a person's life. Anybody else? I'm looking on your left, my right. I'm looking in the middle now. I'm looking in the final section on the right. Father, thank you for this lovely person who's put their hand up and saying, I don't want to be afraid of God coming in the cool of the night. But I want to know a God who loves me. And I just want you to pray where you are right now and say, God, I thank you. You love me enough to send your son to die on a cross to take away all my sin. I accept you now as my saviour. I give you my life. I pray you'd come into my life and transform me that I might live for you every day. Not for a set of rules, but to fulfil the promises of who I'm called to be. Amen. And now, Father, I pray for the church. I thank you for this great church. And I pray for grace, for grace in the Grace Centre to come and to change commandments into promises. Lord, you've not told us we don't have to keep the commandments. You're just saying to us, we will be able to. And I pray grace over this house. I pray for the revelation that God's not here to be a policeman to check up on you every five minutes, but rather he's like your coach just saying, you can do this. You can do this. He's the most encouraging father you could ever think of. And I pray, let commandments be turned into promises that the glory might go to the Father in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. David is going to be with us tomorrow uh, evening, tomorrow morning, uh, for our final uh, day of the Moore Conference. If you would like to come tonight, Chris McLaurin is going to be leading worship. Me and AJ will be ministering tonight at the conference. It starts at 7 p.m. But uh, before you break for lunch, we have a ministry team who would love to pray for you this morning. We would love to minister physical healing. We would love to pray for encouragement for you. And if you would like to receive prayer, please make your way over to this aisle. And Mike here will just allocate you to one of our prayer team. Have a fantastic Memorial Day uh, tomorrow. Enjoy your day. Um, thank you so much for being here. And bless Luke if you see him. And uh, thank you. We'll see you next week.